May we now request our chief guest, Dr. Farooq Odwadia, to please address us. Thank you. Like this. Uh, distinguished members on the dais, awardees, Rajiv, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to this function. I feel a bit like a fish out of water with so many business people around, but uh, anyway, my sincere thanks. Let me start first by congratulating all the awardees. Very well done. I was told that it is a measure of quality. The quality cannot be static. Everything in life is a chronicle of change. So quality has to change naturally for the better. The way I look at quality in anything and everything is that it should be, con it should be combined with great ethics, number one. It should be combined with a great responsibility, number two. And, if possible, it should be combined with a certain degree of social awareness. So if a business really has real quality in the product that it makes or in the service that it offers, it would be really first class and excellent par excellent, I would say, if it combines all these factors with quality. Now, as I said, they are all business people. The only other business house I know besides the Bajaj. Incidentally, Rajiv, I don't know, besides knowing your father very well, I knew your grandfather fairly well. In fact, I looked after him when he was ill at the surgical ICU at Breach Candy Hospital for quite some time. The only other business house that I seem to know is the castrol. I don't know why I remember because maybe I was given castrol as a child. <laughs> every every Sunday I had to come running because it's so awful, pinch my nose, and my mother would shove the castrol tablespoon into my. Maybe that's why I remember castrol. <laughs> but there's one uh, awardee here who I know very well, and that is because they are medical people running a hospital. It's the Ganga Hospital, it's Sabapati and Rajashikar, two doctors, two brothers, who run the hospital beautifully. I've been there, I've seen it, and I can't think of a really better hospital than this. Not only is there quality, it is a social responsibility because they look after the poor, and there is a great deal of ethics in what they do. So I'm very proud to be here today to see that they have been honored, rightly honored, and I'm so glad that they've got their parents with them. Give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I think, I think the parents deserve this award as much as these two young men. It is at home and at school that one learns to tread the path the right path when goes out, one more goes out into the outside world. And therefore a great deal of this credit indeed goes to them. I was asked to talk about health. I can't possibly talk of anything about business. I know nothing about it. So let me just give you some ideas, rather a serious talk on health. I asked myself while I was coming in the car, what shall I talk? And I asked myself, let me ask a question, what is good health? Why did I say that? Because a patient came to me this morning and he said he was in good health but he was really not in good health. I'll tell you why. Let me tell you what good health really is. is a, it is a state of physical, mental and social well-being. Most people think that health is about your body 
and whether you have disease or disability. It's not just the absence of disease or disability. It is a state of physical, mental and social well-being. You must be well in all these three. Now, everybody, want, everybody knows about the body when you don't feel well, when you have pain, etc. But people seem to ignore the importance of the mind. The mind is extremely important. You have a mind-body complex about which a lot of great work is being done in many laboratories all over the world. The mind controls the body. The mind colors a disease, even a disease process can be colored by the way your mind looks at it. And sometimes the mind is so affected by the various stresses and strains of living that it produces symptoms exactly like that produced by organic disease. And so when you talked about your yoga and when you talked about the fact that your Guruji made you do things and you felt no pain, do you realize it was the mind here which was acting on the body? It is indeed such an important thing. And then, of course, social. It means, you know, that you must have relations, social relations with the outside world. It's only when all these three are present that you could say that you are in real good health. I think that's one important thing I wanted to talk to you as people. I think there are very few doctors here except my two friends. It's, uh, I thought I should talk to you about that. Now, I want to talk about something serious in medicine. What ails medicine today? Uh, you all know that the great advances in science and technology have completely altered the face of medicine. And medicine is capable of producing miracles which would have been deemed incredible just 60 or 70 years ago. But yet, there is a start of a delusion, disillusion uh, an almost antagonism at this point in time in many parts of the world, both to medicine and medical practitioners. Why do you say that? Look, look at the number of cases against doctors in the courts, in various courts, uh, the civil courts, the high courts, the supreme courts and what have you. Look at the fact that, you know, when something goes wrong, when a patient dies, sometimes they attack hospitals, attack doctors, you know, assault them, etc., burn down hospitals, burn down nursing homes. It just shows you the anger the people have. It's a strange paradox, indeed. Because 70 years ago, when medicine had not achieved anything at all, or very little compared to what it has today, it was the most respected profession. And the image of the doctor was better than in any other profession. So what has gone wrong? I think over a period of time, medicine seems to have strayed from its path. The mechanization of medicine, the hubris of its science and technology has submerged the art within medicine and has robbed it of its very essence, its humanism, its humanity. It's not that one doesn't appreciate science and technology, it's science and technology which has made medicine take a quantum leap into the 21st century. But one must remember, and the medical profession must indeed remember, that there is much more to medicine than science and technology. Technology cannot substitute for a nicely detailed taken history. It cannot substitute for a meticulous physical examination with your eyes, your ears and your hands. It cannot take the place of a doctor relieving the anxiety of a very ill patient or the anxiety of those close to him and near and dear to him. Technology, science cannot do that. 
So the first unfortunate thing that has happened to medicine, and amazingly it's because indirectly related to science and technology, that the empathy that a doctor has for a, should have for a patient is no longer there. And that is sad, because it affects the doctor-patient relationship, the bond between the doctor and patient, which is so important. I mean, it's not important when a patient has a cold or a cough which goes away, but it's extremely important when a patient is really ill, that bond between the doctor and the patient, which lies at the very heart, crux, the soul of medicine. That, ladies and gentlemen, is unfortunately lost. What else is there that ails medicine? I think it's the commercialization of medicine, which was never there when I started work. When I say commercialization of medicine, I mean it's money that speaks, it's money that matters. It's a loss of ethics. How do I look upon medical ethics? What is medical ethics? Medical ethics is the moral obligations that govern the practice of medicine. If the practice of medicine is governed first by the amount of money you want to earn, it is lost. There is no morality in that. Of course doctors should earn money, but if you put money before your patient, instead of the other way around, that leads to corrupt practices, and that, unfortunately, is indeed so. I'm not going to detail them, but that indeed is so. Is there anything else? Yes, I think so. I think it is the commercialization of medicine also. It is also the tremendous cost that people have to meet with, particularly in large cities when they are terribly ill. Some of this cost is inescapable, it runs with the times. But I think the costs would be less if doctors would perhaps use a medication which is equally effective but cheap compared to what they sometimes use. Or they do investigations which are absolutely necessary and not go through a whole gamut of investigations from head to toe when a patient has a sniffle in the nose. So that again is important. And then there is again another thing in the city, that you observe in the city today particularly, and that is the institutionalization of medicine. What does that mean? A hospital nearby has this equipment. I am two kilometers away, I must have the same equipment, because I otherwise will be deemed inferior to that. So you have the same equipment, which is very expensive, which has a short half-life, comparatively speaking, within an area of four kilometers. What does that mean? The dean or the superintendent or the CEO of the hospital says, well, I can't, what are you doing? I mean, you're not running this wretched machine. I mean, we've paid so many crores for it. So the doctor willy-nilly wants to put patients into that? Patients become fodder for the machines. And that, again, is unhealthy practice. So you see, there is a falling standard of values in the medical profession today, which I think should be righted. It's interesting, you know. I don't know how many of you have heard of Ivan Illich. I used to make it compulsory reading for my boys and girls and my registrars when I was at the JJ and even now. He was not a doctor, he was a great sociologist. He was a professor of sociology in Mexico. And he wrote a remarkable book which tore the medical profession to pieces. It was the other side of the coin which he was showing. And amongst the things that he said, and mind you, he was an extraordinarily clever man, because what he said, you know, he cited through journals, actual medical journals, citing them to make his case. He said the medical profession, unfortunately, has had a lot of iatrogenesis. What does iatrogenesis mean? Iatros is physician, and genesis is made by the physician. 
That's really one. The, the physician is supposed to heal, he's not supposed to make disease. And he said there are three great forms of iatrogenesis that the physician has made. The first he called clinical iatrogenesis by giving medications, doing things which have caused harm to people. And he cited chapter and verse to show how many people had suffered from them and had died from them also. Mind you, he's clever, he cited great journals, important peer-reviewed journals to prove his point. That's understandable now. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that any medicine that you give has always some side effect. There is no medicine which has worth its name which you can say has no side effect at all. So this is a provision that Ivan Illich should have thought of when he wrote this. But the second and third were rather interesting to me. The second iatrogenesis, he said, was social iatrogenesis, and that was very interesting. He said the medical profession, mind you, he's not a doctor, so he looks at it completely differently, is so constructed, has so constructed itself, that for every little thing, the patient will run to the doctor or to the hospital. And that is very good for the medical profession, but it is not good for society. They should learn, by and large, to look after themselves. And the third very interesting thing he said was the medical profession is bent on cultural iatrogenesis. What is cultural iatrogenesis? Cultural iatrogenesis is that you must fight every disease and every illness right up to the nth moment in time, which is not right. There is a time to live and there is a time to die. And it is the medical profession, really, who without any bias must realize that doing things further is going to harm the patient, hurt the patient, cause more pain, cause more suffering. You need to relieve him. You need to placate him and the family around him. At last, the medical profession is beginning to realize that. It has realized that in the West, but is now even beginning to realize this in our part of the world. These are some of the things I thought I would like to share with you. I think I'd also like to say something about the health in our country. It's a huge country. For doctors, it's a remarkable country. Because we see everything or every disease the West suffers from, by and large. And yet, we see disease which is very peculiar to our part of the world. That is why many doctors, clinically speaking, you know, are very often as good as better than some of the people in the West. That's one major reason. I don't know if you know, if you look, look at disease basically and divide disease, and you could divide them into two groups communicable diseases and non communicable diseases. The non-communicable diseases which you see in the West are very much here, like heart disease, like strokes, like lung problems, like diabetes. These are all non-communicable diseases. But we have a large share of communicable diseases. And I just want to talk about two so that I bring you an awareness of the extent of the problem of two of these diseases. One is tuberculosis particularly pulmonary tuberculosis. I don't think any of you all are aware, except perhaps my two doctor friends, that there are 300 million people in our country infected with tuberculosis, of which 14 million are active, which means they are suffering from tuberculosis and spread it from one to the other in society. I don't know if you're aware, I don't think you are, that there are roughly 500,000 deaths of, of TB in our country, which means one death a minute in this country. And I don't know if you are aware that the World Bank, this is not my figure, the World Bank says that India loses 30 billion dollars because of this disease which very often strikes people in their working age 
incapacitates them, makes them take loans because treatment can be expensive and is responsible for, therefore for shattering families and producing great suffering. And the worst calamity now is, and few people seem to realize this, that a large number of our tuberculous population is resistant to the usual drugs. They call it multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. There are 800,000 of that Indians in that category. And that's a dreadful disease. It's as bad as cancer, worse than cancer. It's almost impossible to treat unless you pay a large sums of money and you don't have that. Most people don't have that. And can you imagine 800,000 people, most of them untreated, infecting others around them with a germ which is also going to be multi-drug resistant. It's a horrendous problem. And though the government is trying hard to tackle it, God alone knows how it's all going to turn out. And then the other disease, HIV. We have the largest population of HIV-infected people. A couple of million people. And the amazing thing is that these two diseases feed each other. Which means that tubercle makes HIV worse and HIV makes tubercle worse. And there are so many people, so many Indians who are infected both with tubercle and HIV. Now I want to tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen. You can't look at health in a cocooned manner, in an isolated manner, straight-jacketed. Health is closely related to economics. And can you believe it? We spend just 1% of our GDP on health. All countries spend close to 5, 7, 8% on their health. 1% on health. Should then, shouldn't that be, shouldn't that be changed? Look at the environment these people live in. I mean, we sit here, we are well fed, well nourished, we go back to good flats, etc., good environment. But 40% of our patients are below the poverty line. 46% of our children are malnourished. And the infant and child mortality is amongst the highest in the world, second perhaps only to African countries. So you see how economic forces, political forces, because how can your economic improve if there has not the political will to do so? Social forces, the division between castes, creeds, etc. All that comes into play. And all those interact, really, in relation to health in our country. I'm sorry to speak to you on such a sad note, but I thought, uh, you know, there must be some awareness amongst people as to what doctors have to contend with. And, of course, education. For example, just think, for example, if to control health, you did nothing but just said, I'm going to make sure that there is water in every household in the country, that there is good sanitation and good hygiene, that there is good nutrition and that there is good housing. Would you know, there would be a sharp increase in the health in most of our companions in this country. It's so simple when you come to think of it. In other words, it's a question of infrastructure, true, real infrastructure. And education is important, of course. The education of doctors is not really as it used to be in my time. Really not, used, not as good as it used to be in my time, for several reasons. How, what, how are you going to do that? It has to start at home. It has to start in school, it has to go into college, and it has to proceed from there. Right ideas, right ideals, right principles were inculcated into us when we went to school and college. 
things have changed and values have changed. I'm going to end with a quote from a great, great physician, William Osler, when he said, medicine is both an art and a science. It is an art and not a trade. It is a profession and not a business. It is something which will exercise your heart as much as it will exercise your brain. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for a very informative.